for me. So you got your uh, progress reports back, right? Um, and on all of them, such a high chair. On all of them, I made comments on what you've been looking at so far, where you're going to go. The number of sources that people looked at range from around two to four at the low end to a couple of people who had like 16 that they'd already consulted, which is like, wow. Um, remember for everybody, I'll mention out loud, even though it's on the individual feedback you got back, that you should. Don't neglect to look for a National Gallery catalog that's relevant to your work. That's where you're most likely to find a direct discussion of your picture. It's on something that was published by the National Gallery, uh, because that's part of their job, is to research and publish information on works of art that they own. So whether it's an exhibition catalog where your picture was displayed, or whether it's a catalog of the permanent collection, that systematic catalog that I've mentioned in the instructions. These are really important places to look um, as you're continuing to do research on your work. In either of those two sources, be sure you also check the bibliography. This is an important thing <clears throat> when you're doing research in general, is when you pick up a source that looks like it might be helpful, one of the things that's worthwhile doing before you put that source away is to check and see um, what they've been looking at as well. Check the footnotes, check the bibliography, because there might be something out there that has eluded you so far, a source that's specifically on exactly the sort of question that you're trying to answer. What is the symbolism of that thing in the corner? There might be an article on the symbolism of that thing in the corner, right? And you just haven't found it yet, because it's in some out of the way study, you know, place, right? So uh, be sure you do that. That's where you find more things often than doing um, source searches on the library catalog. As you continue to make progress toward your final paper, which is due in the last week of class, the other thing to keep in mind is you know, don't wait until the last minute and apply yourself to the task at hand. A lot of people had four or five sources, but all of them were things that were available online and ignoring ever going to the library. It was obvious that you just sort of found what you could, you know, without leaving the comfort of your, your dorm room. And, you know, those didn't get as good as the people who really applied themselves to all sorts of different sources and really made the effort to get out and, and, and find these things. So be sure you do that before the day is over, because if you limit yourself to things <clears throat> that you can access online uh, through PDFs, you're going to limit your ability to succeed, right? A vast majority, and I hope this isn't a huge surprise, a vast majority of the best information is not available online, period, right? Increasingly more and more is, right? But books, printed matter is the history of us for the last 500 years. We shouldn't ignore it, right? Also, as you're looking, if you do look at other online sources, remember that the research paper has, the instructions have very, very clear verbiage about using um, printed sources, right? Don't be going to Billy Bob's website. If you have any kind of question about whether or not this is a viable source, you should be asking me before you turn the paper in. If I find that you've been relying on your lecture notes, I've got nothing new to say, right? Very Most of my stuff comes out of things I've researched. You're running on your lecture notes, you're relying on <clears throat> even museum websites, it just shows me that you're kind of lazy. You're not going to get out there and do this work. This is, requires work. And, and you just make sure you apply yourself to the task. That's why you've got, you've had this assignment since before class started, right? We've been going over from time to time, but you know, this, there's no surprises here, right? And part of having, 15 weeks to work on it is to A, find a slot in there to do it, but B, give it more than a, you know, a couple of hours, right? That's why it's worth so much of your grade, okay? So uh, continue to pound the pavement uh, as you do the research, and don't hesitate to ask me questions if they come up, because I'm here to help, all right? I'm not just here to grade.
uh, I'm here to help as well. All right? We're going to make the 20th century. I guarantee you. Okay? We're going to get there. Uh, we were looking at Romanticism uh, at the end of class on Thursday. <clears throat> we were looking at different varieties of Romantic landscapes. Uh, from the nostalgic, where progress doesn't have any impact, where the Industrial Revolution seems to have never happened, in the case of Constable in England on your left, and this image of the, his childhood uh, stomping ground where he grew up, or uh, a much more dramatic landscape filled with every conceivable bit of drama and uh, extraordinary feature, in the case of Bierstadt in America, uh, with these, these uh, theatrical images that really show us the, the dramatic power of nature, right? Uh, both of these uh, fall into this range of, of landscapes that we call romantic landscapes. And we really only look at England and America. We could talk about romantic landscapes when it came to France with Jericho's Raft of the Medusa as well, threatening to be swamped by nature's power. We also find romantic landscapes in Germany. We have a really nice example of a German romantic landscape in that regard by, by probably the single best German romantic landscape painter, Catherine of the Friedrich. Uh, Friedrich's image here on the left, uh, much less dramatic, uh, much less nostalgic, but still equally romantic because in all of these images we find, I think, the artist looking at landscape as a place to go discover something greater than ourselves. Looking to landscape to provide us with some inspiration to uh, ideas that are uh, above our everyday existence. And so Friedrich gives us this, this frigid winter landscape. Um, I think it's thawing. I think it's the snows have started to thaw. We'll see some details that show this. But he also gives us two tiny little figures wandering along the, the edge of this frozen lake under this, this very dark and wintry sky, uh, you know, sun glimmering through. But you get the sense, you know, this is northern Germany, and you get the sense, have you ever been to a, a city that's quite a ways north? And I'm not like to talk like New York or something. Uh, but there are certain places in, in northern Europe where it doesn't really get light during the winter. You know, this happens in Alaska as well, Nova Scotia, right? Uh, northern places where it's, in the summer it's, it's, it's kind of light all day and up until 10 or 11 at night. And in the winter it never really gets light because the sun stays so, low, stays so low on the horizon. And Friedrich is capturing that, right? Here even um, with the brightness at the top you get a sense that this is the middle of the day but at the same time the sun ain't too high up there and, and there's a sense that it's still sort of wintry darkness, right? I lived in uh, Belgium for a couple of years uh, before I moved here. And um, in the middle of the winter, it was like, well, in the summer, it was like light till 11 o'clock at night, right? My friend Jake, when he came to visit me, said, this is going to really mess up my beer drinking because, you know, you give up about an hour after it gets dark, but it didn't get dark till 11. In the winter, right, you, it would get light out at about like 10 in the morning and get dark again at 3. You know, it was just, and they're not that far north, it's just where they were in the time zone. And the figure kind of captures that, that, that sort of wintry gloom. What do we call it? Seasonal affective disorder, right? You know, when you, in the winter, when you get all depressed, right? Just because it's not light, they're not getting enough light, right? And he sort of captures that. At the same time, this is sort of a, a mystical way in which it drops down onto the landscape and sort of, sort of uh, fills the entire area with this sort of soft, diffuse light. Here's our tiny. Two little explorers with their hats and their walking sticks and their, their heavy coats. They're certainly not like the kind of things we wear these days, you know, no ski parkas and whatnot. Uh, but out wandering, and you can see, you see them kind of both from the back as they're sort of chatting about what they're looking at. And 
for Friedrich, this is kind of a common theme. He loves to put people in the landscape um, and for us to sort of associate ourselves with. And like these figures, we should look at this landscape and, 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 and think about what are the kind of messages that are out there? Uh, what are the things that, that it might get you to think about that, that, that elevate your own spirit that uh, maybe even make you think about things beyond you know, your everyday mundane existence. And in Germany in the 19th century, uh, there were a number of writers, primarily theologians, kind of quasi-secular theologians, writing about the fact that, that God was reflected in the landscape. And this is, uh, to Christians in the audience, this is not a big thing. This is no great thing. Extraordinary thing in the 19th century Germany. Yeah, God is reflected in his handiwork. And uh, theologians in Germany are particularly uh, uh, adamant about the fact that uh, to understand God better, one should go and look at his creation. And and from looking at the creation, we can we can imagine we can imagine the creator, right? God himself. And so, on a certain level, that's what our figures here are doing. And sometimes Friedrich will include in his landscape certain uh, church references, like a lone church on the horizon, or maybe somebody's erected a cross on the top of one of the mountains. Not in this one, but he sees it in other ones by him. And, and our picture sort of falls into this same theme. Uh, so, uh, one of his most famous images over in Berlin um, of a man sort of in this city clothes. So we're going out for a walk again to ponder uh, the glories of nature. And if we think about all of our romantic landscapes, there's something going on with this, right? This is kind of underscoring, maybe not as obviously, but this is underscoring Church's image of, of Niagara Falls or Thomas Cole's image of the sunlight rising over the, the Casco Mountains. Right, the, this idea, or even Bierstadt's amazing image of the Sierra Nevada mountains, all of these things are sort of like the wonder of nature, right? Um, and that idea of the wonder of nature is, of course, what makes it so incredibly romantic, right? It's, it's, it's reveling in, in nature's power to amaze us, in nature's power to dwarf us, right? And uh, with our picture in the National Gallery on the right, you can see that they're absolutely dwarfed by the, the world around them. Now, what sorts of things are we supposed to understand here? And I think Friedrich, this is a theme he treats quite a bit, which is that, you know, when things look dead, maybe they ain't. You know? Uh, in the middle of the winter, it looks as if this frozen tundra will never melt. You know, that the earth itself is dead, but this is all part of the cycle, and that there is rebirth at the end of winter. That winter is a necessary part of the cycle. And so he includes in the foreground various places where we're starting to see grass grow again, right? Spring up green from underneath the snow. And so the idea is, of course, that uh, resurrection, that maybe from understanding how the earth comes alive again in spring, around Easter, we might understand how Christ came alive in Easter as well. Okay. So again, romantic landscapes really working on this idea of the power of nature. What better way to do that than to talk of, to, to make images that focus on, on nature's uh, connection to God, to the great maker of all things. Now, Romanticism is primarily early 19th century, but it never really goes away. Uh, we'll find Romantic uh, notions in later movements. We'll find a resuscitation, a, a rebirth of Romantic ideas very strongly at the end of the 19th century under another name. Uh, but there are other movements that begin to arise in the middle of the 19th century that run parallel to it and really become the most important forward-looking movement, the most important avant-garde movement, right? So if we think about these periods that we've been talking about, right? Uh, Rococo, neoclassicism, uh, romanticism, right? Oftentimes they're running parallel to each other. 
But the important thing to keep in the back of your mind is which one is the one that people are looking at as being the groundbreaker, right? The avant-garde. And, and so Rococo is kind of the avant-garde kind of art, the early 18th century. Neoclassicism, avant-garde late 18th century. Romanticism, early 19th century. This then gets replaced, right? By, even though it doesn't necessarily go away. To talk about what happens next in art, right, after the Romantic movement, we need to go back and, and sort of address uh, history a little bit. Because again, the development of art can't really be separated from the development of political, social history, particularly when we're looking at works in France. Now, we just got done sort of skimming over to America and England and Germany. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in France from this point forward. Uh, as we sort of wrap up the 19th century. So a little sort of backstory here, sort of recap what we talked about, right? The first revolution in France was 1789, inspired very much by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, man longs to be free but is everywhere in chains, right? And it eventually led to the Emperor Napoleon through the political events of the end of the 18th century, Napoleon is crowned emperor 1804, right? And remains emperor till 1814 when he is deposed by English troops at the Battle of Waterloo, okay? That then led us to a reinstitution of the monarchy called the Restoration from 1814 through 1830. That was ended by a second French Revolution in 1830. This is the one that is commemorated by Delacroix on your left, where he shows it allegorically, the people of France being led by a vision, by a personification. Liberty, liberty herself, the idea of liberty, right, being given human form. We got the same thing here, don't we? New York, right? The Statue of Liberty. Same idea, less, less nakedness, because we're America, right? Not France, but also in a kind of a similar pose. Yeah? She's leading the real people of France over these romantically displayed dead bodies in the foreground. This is our second French Revolution, okay? The outcome of the second revolution was... Right? They got rid of the monarchs who had inherited their power. They decided to stick with monarchy, but what they decided to go with was the British style of regency, which is what's called a constitutional monarchy. Does anybody know what that is from a poli-sci class? Constitutional monarchy? It's what the Brits have or had in the 19th century, They've sort of gotten rid of it. But the idea is that the power of the monarch is checked, right, is shared with parliament, with a constitution, right, with a representative government who can hold the absolute power of the monarch in check. Okay? So, the, you know, the Brits have the House of Commons and the House of Lords as well as the monarchy. In the 19th century, the monarchy still meant more than it does now, right, where it's kind of just the figurehead. The queen doesn't really make national policy, right? It's made by uh, uh, the prime minister. But in the 19th century, there's still the idea of being led and governed by, by the monarch, in this case, Queen Victoria in England, right? Well, the French tried this idea. They, they set up a king, Louis-Philippe, and he governs under a constitutional monarchy. His power supposedly checked by parliament, right? a representative government. Turns out not to work so well. And in fact, through the time of his uh, reign, and really kind of almost immediately, Louis-Philippe starts to act uh, intolerantly. He tends to set up laws that do not benefit everyone equally and, in fact, have very little benefit for the poor. Most of them, in fact, targeting 
the wealthy, giving the wealthy back money. Money that's gathered in taxes from the poor, being given to the rich. And he becomes criticized for this because in France there is a free press. This is part of uh, uh, the constitutional monarchy is that there will be a free press. Now, at this point, newspapers were illustrated not with photographs like we see today, if you still get a newspaper. Most people don't. We still do, right? In our house, at least. But, you know, now get it online. But they didn't know how to reproduce photographs yet. In fact, 1831, photographs had just been invented. We hadn't really thought of them yet as as something that would document what's going on. And so most uh, newspapers were, in fact, illustrated with prints. And Honoré Daumier worked for a publishing house. He worked for a couple of different weekly newspapers, supplying them with caricatures that were meant to illustrate certain news stories. These became incredibly popular because they were kind of funny. They're sort of the 19th century example of a political cartoon, right? Sorry? Less like the comics and more like, uh, we don't, okay, I I get the New York Times. Just like, because I used to live in New York and I started subscribing for us there and I still do, right? But, uh, so we don't have political cartoons. But there's one page political cartoons on the editorial page. Those sorts of things are more um, close to what they are than actually just the comics, right? Because comics, you know, the comic pages, four panels tells a story. Sometimes it's a a long-standing story, like, you know, Spider-Man, there'll be an arc of a narrative or whatever, right? Sometimes it's peanuts, it's just four things that lead to a punchline. It's not really works that way. These are very much politically minded, right? Uh, And and Domier made a series of these. Sort of the vast majority of his work are these newspaper illustrations, right? But that's what this is. So it's done in what's called lithography. We don't have to worry because it's a complicated process. It's about printing from a stone that has been chemically treated rather than a piece of metal that you've cut, right? And these can be put on the printing press alongside the offset letters that print the word, okay? So uh, Domier, uh, newspaper illustrator, illustrating things inspired by contemporary events. And here, on the right, he gives us a caricature of King Louis Philippe. Louis Philippe had these mutton chops, right? Those are those big sideburns. Uh, you know, men don't wear them anymore because they're, they're really kind of stupid looking. I guess they do if you like run a brewery in Brooklyn or something like that, right? You're a hipster dude. You might have a, a hipster pair of mutton chops. But he had sort of a, a narrow forehead, heavy neck, and these mutton chops that gave him uh, this heavy look, kind of like a pear. And in order to caricature Louis Philippe, in fact, Daumier made a number of images where he turned his head into a pear. And that's the case here. So now we've got big, fat Louis Philippe sitting on his throne. The throne is consciously old school. It looks like an 18th century chair. But Daumier has turned it into a commode, right? It's a toilet that he's sitting on. And he's called Gargantua. Gargantua, which you can label down below, was a character in a 16th century French novel by the father of French literature. The the guy who is to the French, who Shakespeare is to the English, right? Named Rabelais, right? Wrote a, a satirical story called uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel. And Gargantua, this is where we get the word gargantuan from, was a giant. Okay? So that's when we call something big, we say it's gargantuan. It's based on Rabelais' book. And Daumier is using that book for his title as well, Gargantua. In the book, Gargantua was this giant who basically devoured everything around him. He was a, a symbol of gluttony. And so by titling this, what Domier is doing is he's saying that Louis Philippe is also a glutton, right? Someone who simply eats and eats and eats, not because he's hungry, Valerie, not because he's hungry and he only has a moment to eat, but he's just eating because that's all he does, right? Big fat guy just keeps eating, yeah? 
And in this case, so we see him being fed up this ramp that leads to the FP penalty, where they are shoveling stuff into his mouth constantly, right? Absolute gluttony. If we look more closely, we see parents in the background. We see a tax collector here. We see the poor on the right. They are being asked for their tax money. Ha, guess what? They're due tomorrow, right? Your taxes are due tomorrow. Right? We're going to be tax returns by 5 or no, by midnight tomorrow night or file for exemption. I'm sure it'll be something like that. But they're gathering the taxes, right? They're taking the money from the poor. Now, the people who are getting taxes are not the people who have extra money. Right? The people with nothing are being forced to give their money. And what are we doing with the money? We're taking that money, and they are running it up the ramp, and they are stuffing it in the king's mouth. Right? And what does the king do with what he eats? Well, he carries it around, and he digests it, and out the bottom he defecates legal documents. Right? That's all he's good for. Turn money into legal And what are legal documents? Is it lettuce and bread? It says uh, nominations for parents. I can't think of the last word. A prefix here. So he's turning the money that they're giving him into a series of official uh, posts that he has created. Official jobs. And so these these uh, documents that he's defecated are now being taken back to the parliamentary house in the background. Right. So this is a very scathing and slightly humorous uh, representation of the king. And as you might imagine. I guess he probably would have said fake news too. Actually, that may have been a fake cartoon. Uh, he doesn't like this, and in fact, he sued Daumier, had him arrested for this cartoon, had him put in prison for six months for having done this cartoon. Right? But it's very, very critical of the direction of the country. It's focusing on what's going on today and. It helps to illustrate for us the problems in French history in the 19th century. Because we have now two revolutions, right? each of them leading to a different kind of government, both of those governments not without their problems. Right? So the second revolution leads to Louis Philippe. Louis Philippe is not liked at all. And through the course of his career, he becomes increasingly, increasingly unpopular for his policies, right? And this leads to a third revolution. He lasts for almost 20 years, Louis Philippe does. And there is then a third revolution in 1848. Daumier witnesses this. The painting in the Phillips collection shows the people of Paris rising up. Right? This uprising is not just any uprising. This is the beginning of the revolution, right? The third one, and it's the people now revolting against Louis Philippe. Okay, so we got a little bit of French history. Got to put in the context here with what we're talking about. Now, the reason that this is important is that the third revolution in 1848 attempted immediately to address some of the problems that existed under Louis Philippe. And in particular, the thing that they were addressing most was the problems encountered by the poor. They wanted to rectify that. They wanted to make sure that French, the French government, the French society, practiced what it preached, liberty, equality, and brotherhood, equality being the key element here. And so after the Third Revolution, a number of public policies were put into place that were directly intended to benefit the working poor, the people who worked all day but still did not make enough money to live, the people who had been taxed heavily under Louis Philippe. Yeah. So with the Third Revolution, there is a renewed focus on impoverished workers in 1848 in France. 
And this leads to a new art movement called realism. This becomes the new avant-garde art movement in mid-19th century France. Realism. Romanticism is still around. You can still find romantic artists. But realism replaces romanticism as the leading, most forward-looking, most modern kind of art in France. Now, what is realism? We're used to the term realism, meaning simply realistic, right? Realism is just, you know, true to nature. It, it, a work of art that, that doesn't look abstract, doesn't look expressionist, looks like what it's trying to look like. It's realistic. But that's not what they meant. That's not what realism meant to Gustave Courbet. Realism was the real illustration of real events and real people. And in particular in France, the majority of the early realist painters focused on images of people working in the countryside. So realism has nothing to do with being realistic. Realism has to do with this real portrayal of real people doing real work. Right? That's what realism meant to them. The working poor slaving at their jobs. The people who had been ignored by the previous government. So what Courbet illustrates for us here, and it's a very, very large picture. I should say it was a very large picture. It was destroyed in World War II. It was in Dresden, which we firebombed. But originally, it was eight and a half feet across the base, right over five feet tall, which means the little kid is probably my height or so, right, taller than life size. And he shows two people who are breaking up stones with hammers and hauling them off. And what these people are doing is they are leveling the area where a road is going to be put in, a carriage route. And the idea is that they're trying to grade the road. That's what we call it, right? When you smooth it out as it moves its way through the mountains. And this is something Courbet had seen back in the area where he grew up. We can actually identify right where this is because of the mountains in the background. These mountains are right around Courbet's hometown of Ornan. This is the best illustration of this I could find. It's not been out since I've been here uh, on display at the National Gallery back in storage. Uh, but I found somebody who had a picture of it, and it's not that great. This is the town of Ornan where, where Courbet grew up. The mountains outside Ornan are the mountains in the background of the stone breakers. He had seen this traveling back home, goes back to Paris and paints it. Right? Struck by the plight of the working class. His idea is to show what a struggle this is, to break the stones, to level the road. And including the mountains in the background is part of how he does that. And in fact, Courbet pulls out all the stops in trying to make this look like horrible work. Right? We're very lucky here, aren't we? You got horrible work on this stupid ass term paper, right? But honestly, you're not on your knees breaking up stones with a hammer. Life could be a whole lot worse. And Courbet wants to show us just how bad it just might be, and on a massive scale. The size of picture that was usually reserved for images of royalty. And he shows the two of them, hard at work, tattered clothes, right? They're not getting rich from this. Back-breaking work, the sling holding the rocks that the kid is carrying off, right? uh, more of the rocks that the man is breaking up. There's simple food in the background, pots of water or maybe food uh, behind them. The way in which the clothing that they wear is they wear becomes the same color as the landscape around them. His uh, clogs 
looking quite a bit like rocks on his feet. We don't see either of their faces. They've been dehumanized. And then there's the sense that the boy has nothing to look forward to except to become that old man. That all of the hard work leads nowhere but more hard work. And we add to that the fact that they're building a road. During this time, France is becoming increasingly interconnected through a system of roadways that help people travel from far-flung areas. Ornan is in the foothills of the Alps, right, sort of down near Switzerland. This roadway will help to connect villages like Ornan with the capital in Paris. It will speed up travel between the different towns. But the road, the stonebreakers, will never use this road. They live in Orno. They're helping other people travel there. So their work is not even for their own benefit. They're not even making something that they themselves would ever use. And all of this is intended to highlight the plight of the working poor. That's what realism is all about. It's a very politically charged movement where the artists are seeing themselves as having a role in society where their art can actually help to change attitudes and make the world a better place. Artists may have thought that before. It becomes forefronted here. It becomes highlighted as we get to the realist movement. All of this begins at the Salon of 1848 and continues in the decades following. One of the most famous of these realist pictures is Millet's, the L's are Y, Jean-Francois Millet, image of the gleaners. Again, intended to show the plight of the poor. They too bent over as they work. Still very large, filling the frame very much dignified on a certain level, but downtrodden. And what Mie is trying to show us with his image of the gleaners is the fact that, well, do you know what the word gleaning means? Have you ever heard the word glean in the past? Has anybody ever heard the word? Gleam is shine. Yeah, gleam. Um, gleaning is a term that we tend to use metaphorically now. We, you might hear somebody say, uh, What can you glean from this reading? What do you get from the reading? Right, that's how we would use it. But the term gleaning is is an old medieval term. Going back to the Middle Ages. Um, A gleaner, or gleaning, was a practice wherein, okay, under Middle Ages, we're gonna step back beyond the 19th century, for example, right? In the Middle Ages, peasants worked the land, and all of the Profits from the land went to the feudal landlord, the feudal system, right? So, and the feudal landlord in, in return agreed to protect them should there be war and give them what they needed to live on, right? That's kind of the feudal agreement. That's the old uh, 10th century through 14th, 15th century system of government in Europe, okay? Under feudalism, one of the ways in which the landlord, the feudal lord, fed his peasants was to allow them to glean the fields. And that meant that after they picked the field and gave the proceeds to the feudal lord, they could go back and pick up the scraps. And they could just keep whatever they found without having to give it to the feudal lord. Gleaning. And this is how it became a metaphor. What did you glean from that reading? What sort of scraps did you get? Right? And as you can see, you can, just by hearing this, it's, it's a fairly, um, what do I want to say? Uh, it's a brutal system, right? It's not particularly uh, sympathetic, not particularly helpful. You get to pick what's left while the feudal lord capitalizes on the bounty, okay? Mie 
is showing modern gleaners. Not a medieval scene, but a scene of the modern world where we have this industrial farm. Look at the mountains of hay behind them. Here, it's nice detail. Look at the mountains of hay. There's hay everywhere. And this is an industrial work farm. All of those workers back there, there's a pit boss on a horse. There's the tents back there and the houses for the field workers. And the gleaners have come in after the hay has been reaped and are picking up what's left. And this was a government-sanctioned program in 1848 as a way to feed the poor. The French government, after the Third Revolution, said, gleaning will be made legal again. Gleaners can go out and pick a field after the field owner has harvested. And Millet is being a social critic here. He is showing us the fact that this ain't enough. Juxtaposing what little our three women have in the foreground. And we should assume that each one of them is a different family, right? Three different colored hats, three different women, three different families. Each one is trying to get enough for their family. But then if you look directly behind them, there's obviously enough there. There's a different government program that we might look to. Right? So Mier realism has a very, very strong social agenda. And on the one hand, that social agenda is to try to focus on the dignity, the humanity of the working poor. But on the other hand, it's also trying to change people's opinions, highlight injustice where it exists. That's art with a social purpose, which many artists still have today. This is why when we look back at 19th century art, we often look at this period of realism as sort of being the beginnings of modern art. Because some of the issues the artists are dealing with are issues artists are still dealing with today. Using art to highlight injustice where it exists. That's a very modern way of thinking about painting. We've got a few Mie pictures around the area. Uh, the potato harvest up in Baltimore at the Walters Museum uh, is very similar in theme and style to the Gleaners, where our peasants are in the foreground monumental, looming large over the landscape. And again, trying to gather what they can to survive. In this particular case, there's not a sense of the same sort of helpless starvation that the gleaners have. They do, in fact, have sacks full of potatoes. But it is, after all, potatoes, and not much more. That's all they're really gathering from the land that they have. And what kind of a diet is that? Now, I like French fries and shrimp, and that's that, right? And I, when we go out, I buy them because I don't know, you know, I know how to make them at home. I'm not going to go through the trouble. It's too much of a mess, right? But three meals a day, seven days a week, I don't know, right? There's only so much you can do with a cane. And I think that's part of the EA's message is not only their poverty shown through uh, the lack of variety uh, in their food, uh, but also, I think, the dignity of these people. Working hard into the evening, working through a storm uh, in order to gather what they need uh, to feed their families. Another realist picture, a very massive one done at the National Gallery. Uh, uh, Harvesting rapeseed. Uh, rapeseed is also called colza. Uh, and I have something in my notes here about rapeseed. What is it? I have to look this up because I don't know it nearly as well. Uh, mustard family, right? It's a yellow flower from the mustard family. And rapeseed, uh, the seeds from these flowers, from colza, were used actually to make uh, cooking oil with. You could squeeze them and, and like sunflower seeds, uh, you can, you can derive oil from it. And so what we have is this, again, monumental-sized woman 
uh, sifting out the seeds, uh, people carrying the harvest of the uh, of, of of the grain uh, through the countryside, and everyone with a certain amount of dignity, certain amount of power, taking up a significant amount of the composition and going about their actions with great dignity despite their poverty. These are not the poor being shown to degrade them. These are the poor being shown to elevate their status. But at the same time, we see that this hard work right, is something that they have to do and, and work the rest of their lives around. Uh, it may bring them a certain dignity, the hard work itself. Tale, may bring a certain dignity, but at the same time, our poor uh, mothers have to bring their children with them to the harvest. Again, not enough is provided to allow them to leave the children at home. So again, highlighting the poor, the, in particular the working poor. This is, this is a key element of what the realist movement is focusing on. Now, up to now, we've been looking at these rural scenes. Realism as a movement also had scenes of urban life. And the best practitioner of this, the most famous practitioner of realist scenes of urban life is Manet, Edward Manet. And uh, for my money, one of the three or four great pictures in the National Gallery. This is just such a fantastic picture. Now, it's urban versus rural, right? Uh, at the same time, she's a working woman. She's a nanny. She has a puppy. I got a picture of the puppy. Trust me, I have a picture of the puppy. She's a nanny. This is not the mother of the daughter. This is the, uh, you know, the daykeeper, if you will. So it again is a scene of, of, of labor, if you will, different kind of labor, not back breaking, but labor nonetheless. And certainly, she's not well to do. The clothes that she has are probably given her by the family. Right? She's working to get by. And she has her charge out, and they've gone out for a little walk around the town. By the way, taking walks around Paris is what people always did, always do. They even have a term for it. A flaneur is someone who walks around the city just to look at the city. Something we don't really do. We're not here. Maybe in D.C. a little bit. Certainly in New York. right? Treat the city as a little entertainment. A little bit of theater. Here we get in our cars, right? Past people on the right. Uh, don't like to wander around and look. You can see what they've been doing. They've had a little lunch. There's some grapes uh, in the lower right corner uh, on the ledge. Uh, she's brought a book so they can just go out and get a little fresh air, right? And they stopped by the side of a railway yard. And as Jillian said, yeah, about the cutest dog in the National Gallery. Uh, for my money. He's certainly one of the two or three cutest puppies uh, that you'll ever find. I think it's, just, it's, it's beautifully painted, too. I love how many often can understand how to put the brush strokes so that they follow the structure of the, of the head, like the white that comes over his head. It's not just laid down any one direction, but in fact, the brush itself starts to sort of sculpt the hairs as they come over the top of his little puppy ears, right? or work around the eye socket. He has an amazing sense of structure, right? That comes through, and he's just as cute as can be, right? Now, where are they? The railway. This has caused some critics a little bit of anxiety. Uh, they criticize the picture because it's called the railway, but you don't see the railway. Um, they're looking at a railway yard. They are on the edge of the place where the train tracks leave the station and branch out in different directions. And you see behind the little girl, behind the head of the nanny, you see the steam from the train, but you don't actually see the train. And when this went on display in 1874 at the annual Royal Academy Salon, 1874, the critics say, why did he call it the railway? Where's the railway? What he shows us instead is the railway yard. And the sign is that the railway is there without actually showing us the railway. Um, where are they? I thought 
thought I had a slide with this. Well, here, I got, I think I have another slide coming. I got another one coming up. Okay. Um, the other Bethesda Cougars. Uh, Kate French, she's better than me. Uh, but that's kind of where they are, right? Uh, we, we, we spent a day looking around trying to figure out exactly where they were. And they're sort of looking a little bit more to the right. And they've, you know, the 100 here since, 150 here since they've replaced them. They're really like their normal artifacts. They should be where they are. So it takes you, and you can see the railway tracks now behind them there. With uh, the railway shed, uh, sort of off to the left of her head, um, Garth and Rebel kind of smiles a lot more now. She's trying to look like the model in the mermaid. I thought she did a pretty good job. And that's kind of where they are, right? Uh, so that's where we were over there. Uh, there's a big bridge that crosses the railway tracks there, and then you come around the corner there, and that's kind of where we are, right? So this bridge is here. Uh, you see a little bit of that bridge. And you over here see that okay. So they're looking down on this. And this is kind of an important part of this picture. And again, we're going to put this into the context of 19th century France. They're at Saint Lazare train station. The railway is a train moving into or out of Gar San Lazar, San Lazar railway station, St. Lazarus railway station. Now, railways were pretty new at this point. And this, I think, is an important part of Manet's approach to his art within this realist context. Realism is focusing on contemporary scenes, right? Contemporary scenes of workers. Manet loves to focus on contemporary Paris, modern Paris to him. To us, it's the beautiful old Paris, but to him, it's modern Paris. And railways were new. The first interurban railway connected Brussels and one of its suburbs in 1835. So by 1874, the idea of having urban railway stations was a new thing. And in order to get San Lazar railway station with the train yard that we see behind, a lot of Paris had to be cut down. They had to dig it out, tear down buildings, cut into the street down below street level in order to put these stations in and around Paris, as well as the tracks that leave the town. All of this displaced people, right? So what Manet shows us is an image of one of the most contemporary parts of Paris, right? A contemporary construction site, right? Now let's put this into a little bit of context. Back to our little French history lesson. Third Revolution, 1848, we talked about that, right? Got rid of Louis Philippe. The French decide in 1848, Hey, we got an idea. How about a president like America with a term limit? Right? Because no more monarch, we're done. And they elect as their very first president in 1848, a cousin of Bonaparte, Louis Napoleon. Bad idea. If you want somebody who's going to be there for term limit, you want Bonaparte? I mean, come on, right? Louis Napoleon. And so he's there, he takes, his, he takes the presidency, well, well, it was 1848. He's going to have a four-year term limit. He'll be out of office in 1850 no matter what. 1851, he stages a military coup. It's a backing of the army, and he has himself declared Emperor Napoleon the right. First. Yeah. And he stays on the throne all the way until 1871. Right? So, again, unfortunate French, right? They died, they bailed, died, they bailed, died, they bailed, right? 1871, he's finally the throne, okay? Now, Napoleon III, right? After he declares himself now emperor, no longer president, decides that he does not want another uprising against him like the one that actually put him in power in the first place. And the way the uprising worked in France was that France was, in 1848, an old medieval tale, very large, right, where it had grown sort of through the years, little by little, cobbled together, right? And that meant that 
the street pattern is winding alleys and bends, right? And if you ever go to Paris, every time the street turns a little bit, they change the name of it, right? But back then, they were just narrow streets. And that's because Paris was not originally settled by the Romans, who liked big, wide avenues and rectilinear street lanes, right? It wasn't a Roman city. It was a medieval city. It was people who lived in the city. And by 1848, with this wandering pattern of streets, it was very easy for small groups of people to pick up the cobblestones and build a wall and hold off the troops, right? And so very small groups of people could fight very effectively against the royal army, right? The barricade. Uh, to the barricade was the great rallying cry. And that's kind of what we see here in the Dominion's picture where we see one of these little wandering avenues and the people crowding together in it. And it was only through this tunneling, right, that was brought about by the small, by the city plan, that they could actually succeed. So Napoleon III decides that he does not want that to happen again. Let's get rid of the little streets. Let's cut boulevards. We all know about the Paris today, right? Cuts boulevards through... The city. This will allow easy transportation. That means if I want to send troops somewhere, I can send troops somewhere. Right? In mass. And the boulevards that we become familiar with today are all part of what Louis Philippe put, or excuse me, what Napoleon III put into Paris. Right? So here's a more impressionist picture of the Boulevard des Italiens, which is uh, one of the Grand Boulevards, right, uh, in Paris. Um, and these were the creation of Napoleon III. Hired an architect named George Haussmann to design Paris. Right? Easy transit, air, and he sold it to the people. And you know what? He didn't, he didn't say, I'm out here to do this. I'm out here to make sure there's no further revolution. What he advertised it as was health and hygiene. You know, easy transit. You can get from A to B quickly. So, you know, Daryl can get to Fox Town fast. I'll, I'm all for that, right? Um, and, it, you know, uh, in addition to that, air would travel better, so there won't be as much cholera in the city, all right? Uh, because when you get airflow, you don't get sort of dank, cool-ridden alleyways, right? And he had other things put in street lights, he put in sewers, right? It was a big redesign plan, and he put in these massive buildings lining the avenues with shop fronts on the ground level, right? And apartments up above. And these start to go in 1853 was when Hausman was hired. And these, this is going on, this building is going on through the 50s and the 60s, all the way through the rest of Napoleon's career. So when we talk about managed railways, right, let's go back to our picture. It shows us this part of Paris that has been changed, right? That's the theme, changing modern Paris. And Paris was changing drastically everywhere. Not just the railways, but also the boulevards were being changed. Paris was not the city it was 20 years ago, when Manet came to the city of Paris was a new and different city. With any kind of project this big, with any change this radical, you might imagine some blowback. Not everybody thought it was a great idea. A lot of people lamented the fact that their Paris had disappeared. But what happened to my town, the place where I grew up? Add to that the number of people who had to be displaced. Paris had always been a city of workers, now becoming a city of aristocrats. Because these boulevards are lined by grand apartments. The people who used to live there, tell me this doesn't sound like a common story, gentrification, are pushed out to the outskirts of the city. And the central cool part of town is only inhabited by the wealthy. This is all part of the redesign. So there is some backlash against modernization. In Paris. 
And that sort of makes sense if you think back to the Romantics, who had come just before the realists, where they talk about progress, and sort of looking for a landscape where these tendencies haven't been faded yet. Right? It's comfortable. When we look at Nanny's picture, even though it's a realist picture, celebrating modern times, one wonders if under the surface of all of this, there isn't some critique. She's looking at nothing. We don't see the benefit. We see the steam of the train, but not the train. Right? As little girl stares at the emptiness behind her. Is Manet giving voice to what was a prominent criticism in Paris at the time? Namely, that this redesign was a problematic thing. That's one way in which we might interpret this picture. Knowing the historical context is that Manet is giving us an image that voices some of the criticisms that we find when we look at late 19th century Paris. But another way we might interpret this is going a little bit more deep into French history of the 1870s. Because the redesign happened under Haussmann, happened under Napoleon III. Napoleon III is driven from office in 1870. Not by a revolution, but by a foreign invasion. In 1870 and lastly in 1871, uh, Otto von Bismarck, the Chancellor of Germany, invades France. And he doesn't really want to take over France. He doesn't want to take over Germany in the 20th century. But Bismarck does not really want to annex France. He just hates Napoleon III. And he has a good reason for it. Bismarck died. European 19th century history in two minutes or less. Okay? Napoleon I, Napoleon Bonaparte, right? That one. Had tried to unify all of Europe under his leadership, right? When he gets kicked out of office, we start to see the rise of the different nation states that we're used to today. So yes, Napoleon is gone, right? And so it's at that point that Belgium becomes a country that we know of Belgium today, or even Belgium before, 1831, right? Just after the wake of Napoleon, okay? Germany, prior to Napoleon the first, Bonaparte, right? Prior to Napoleon, Germany had been a series of smaller empires. Not a single unified German government. Unless we go back to the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. But there had never really been a, a German leadership per se. After Napoleon, there's an attempt to unify these different parts of Germany into a single country. Right? This is what Napoleon III doesn't want. Because Napoleon III, he's now taking emperor, right? If Germany becomes a unified country, Napoleon III feels threatened. So he's doing everything he can to keep Bismarck from unifying Germany. This leads to the French Prussian War. Bismarck wants Napoleon III out of office. So the Prussian army invades France with one motive in mind, get rid of Napoleon III and his diplomacy, right? Pretty quickly, as a matter of fact, the French fall very fast, okay? They succeed, uh, the Prussian army then wants to withdraw immediately, because mission accomplished, right? The city of Paris refuses to acknowledge the new government and declares themselves independent from the rest of France. 
This is called the French or the Paris Commune in 1871. But so before the Russian army pulls out, they're starting to establish some resentment. The people of Paris say, eh, we're not going to go with them. They're not being attacked by a foreign government. So they declare themselves independent. What do you suppose Bismarck and his army does? He goes and takes the crap out of them, right? So they move in after about three months into the Paris Commune. The Prussian army moves in and kills something like upwards of 30,000. Like a month and a half, right? Smolts the commune, restores order. But the bottom line is that all of this, a lot of this new building that was going on under Hausen, right, level. A lot of Paris is very, very badly damaged in the, the squelching, the defeat of the Paris commune. Aftermath of this, coming back to Manny's picture. A lot of history in this picture. Back to Manny's picture. On the one level, it could be a critique of earlier development, but after the commune, right, the defeat of the commune in 1871, the French government is a lot of money into rebuilding. So it's the idea that we are now independent from it, and now independent from oppressors, and now rebuilding our nation in what's called the Third Republic. So there's a certain pride in building that's related to a pride in nation after 1871. Go back to Manet, right? Let's go back to the picture. If we look back at what had happened in the 50s and 60s, we say, hey, critique of development, nostalgia for lost time. But if we think about the 1870s, a lot of people in France are saying, you know what? Building is good, right? Redevelopment is good. France, call it again, right? Say that again, folks. Folks, give them our history lesson. Uh, France is back on its feet again. Industry as a symbol of French progress. Right? So two very different ways to interpret the picture. The message that Manet is trying to get across. And it's up in the air as to exactly what he wanted from this, because it's unclear from his own writing, from the critical reception, how people thought about it. You can find a whole group of people in the 70s who were very anti progress, anti redesign of Paris. You can find another whole group in, in the 1870s who see the progress as a sign of a rejuvenation. What are we going to do with that? And there's no easy answer. Now, before we leave men in, uh, we'll wrap this up this evening. <clears throat> Manet's thinking. If you look closely at Manet, right, dive in, you start to understand the picture in two different ways. When we talk about a painting, when we talk about a sculpture, any work of art that represents something, we talk about it. What, what is this? And I try to ask, tell me, I say, what is this? You say, oh, it's a girl, a little girl with her name by the side of a railway. And yeah, you're right. That would be right. right? But I can also say, what is this? It's a piece of canvas with some paint on it. Right? A painting can actually store two different things. Right? A painting is a representation. And a painting is an object. Any questions? That's pretty straightforward, yeah? Usually the two go hand in hand. And when we look at the picture, the idea of the object sort of takes a back seat to the representation so that we focus on what is represented. Manet levels the playing field. He makes you aware again and again and again that you are looking at an object. You're not looking at a representation. Okay. You still don't forget that, but you become aware that this is paint that's been put on a flat surface. For many people, there's an even criticism for this, right? Because in the art academy, we would learn how to blend your paints so that you had an even 
radiating personality, and he leaves these patches. In fact, that's what his critics called them, were patches uh, of paint. Sometimes they help to define the structure, like with the puppy dog. Sometimes they really don't. And you try to find some knuckles in there, you know? And you realize that from a distance it works okay, but up close it just gets disappeared. Right? One critic say, I, see, I, I don't see bone underneath the skin anymore. This is kind of the criticism he got. As he's, again, laying down the paint in a, in a way where he's not trying to blend uh, the strokes. Look at that, right? Pits of the white that's picked up and sort of skidded across the canvas. Uh, critics call them patches of color. And these, as you look at them, constantly remind you that Let's go back to like Van Eyck's Ramon. Just I don't have any photos of that. Just think in your mind of a painter like Jan Van Eyck. Um, and, th and think in your mind of like one point perspective, right? And Renaissance art and Renaissance pictures. And you think about the fact that on a certain level, eventually the picture frame becomes a window that you look through, right? Because everything deep in. And it was sort of like we see the wall around it, and then this flat thing looks three-dimensional. Right? And we look through it, and we don't pay attention to the surface. Because we pay attention to how it continues our space. And then I played with that deep shadows, right? That was cast in from the frame. Or a mirror that reflected something else outside, right? None of these pictures still does that, but as you're looking at it, it does these things that make you aware that that is a Solid thing. It's not a transparent thing you're looking at. And the paint is part of this. This is how he lays it down in these patches, right? Patch. The, uh, or how he uh, leaves it un unpainted. You're aware that it's unpainted. Right? That Mene is there. And if we look at the composition as a whole, with this grid that's set up by that wonderful beam, that that almost horizontal, or vertical, you know, two horizontals at the bottom, make you aware that this is just this two by two surface, right? It's a two dimensional thing that we're looking at. This is a back and forth between the representation and the object. And then it is, is really strong with that. And the more that we look at the picture, the more we realize that there are these places where it turns utterly abstract. He's not trying to describe anything with the paint. This is the area right behind her hair, where the steam sort of obliterates things behind it. But look at what he's done with the paint. And if I didn't have the entire picture up, why do you think it was an abstract painting from the 1950s? Because it's just laying the paint on the surface. And that's what you end up looking at. Now, this got Manet a lot of heat. Right? It got him into a lot of sort of unfortunate situations, particularly with the critics who felt that he was making fun of the way in which art had always been made. That he was mocking it, mercilessly. That he was being sarcastic, being a, being a stupid kid, if you will. I know that he's kind of getting fairly eight years away from his death at this point. But that he had always been sort of just making fun of the art world. It wasn't well received. Today, we look back at Manet. And we look at what he's doing, and we realize that some of the things that he seems to be working with, this idea that a painting has these two identities, a representation of a subject matter and an object can contain. And as he begins to sort of level that playing field and say, it's, it's both things, he's making a drastic step in a direction that can lead us to because he's saying that this, the paint on the canvas, is every bit as important as whatever he chooses to represent. But the application of the paint is a subject matter in itself. And if we accept that idea, that the application of paint is every bit as important as whatever he chooses to depict, then art in itself is a painting without a subject matter. And the painting subject matter is the application of the paint. 
Clemente stands at a very, very important time in the history of art, and we often call him the father of modern art, simply because some of the chances he takes and some of the risks uh, that he takes are risks that will lead us eventually to modern painting. I have two other Manets to show you very quickly. wish I could show you a ton. Really, we've got eight or nine at the National Gallery, one of the best painters ever. Um, we'll look at two famous works from other museums, and then we'll move into Impressionism. So we're really uh, flying by the wall of work uh, as we get closer to the 20th century. Okay, I will see you guys on Thursday.